My text today, if you want to remain standing there at home in honor of God's word, good thing to do even there at home. My text today uh, on this Palm Sunday weekend. Yes, it's Palm Sunday. I know Holy Week has been overshadowed by what's happening in our world right now, but I want us to put the focus back on the seven days that changed the entire world. And my text today comes from the Gospel of Luke. It's a snippet of our Savior on the cross. Luke chapter number 23. I'm going to read verse 26 and then verse 32 through 34 if you're following along. Now, as they led him away, they laid hold of a certain man, Simon, a Cyrenian, who was coming from the country, and on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. There were also two others, criminals, led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Today I want to minister to you on the message of the cross. Is there any other message that we need now more than any other time than the message of the cross? Daily we hear from the CDC and from the President's Corona Task Force, and rightfully so. But today I want you to hear from the Prince of Peace about the HCM, Heaven's Central Message. What is heaven's central message? It's the message of the cross. Listen to what the apostle Paul said, and then we're going to pray. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 23, he said, But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness, but to those who are called both Jews and Greece, Greeks, Christ the power of God, and the wisdom of God. And so that's what we do today, this weekend. That's what we endeavor to do, to preach the cross to a world and a country and a community that is in crisis right now. Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, in the next few moments, would you speak to every single heart? Would you give us hope? Would you feed our faith? And would you help us to keep our eyes focused on you? In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. If you're standing, you can be seated right there where you are. So what is the message of the cross? What is it for today? What does it speak to us at this time of crisis? There's five things that I want to share with you. And I've been teaching in fives because I want to keep you ever mindful of the grace of God. Five is the number of grace. Five things that the cross tells me. Number one, the cross tells me things can change suddenly. Just a few days prior to the crucifixion, Jesus makes his triumphal entry into Jerusalem on a donkey. We know that was called Palm Sunday. They laid palm branches before him. They hailed him as their king. The pomp and circumstance was sort of like New Year's Eve uh, in Times Square. Jesus was the flavor of the day. Everybody loved him. Everybody hailed him. But no sooner did they cheer him, they begin to jeer him. They went from he is king to crucify him. They mocked him with who he claimed to be after cheering who they thought that he was. In a moment, things changed. Let me make it personal to what we're going through right now. At one moment, the stock market could be at an all-time high. The next moment, it could take the biggest dip in U.S. history. One moment, the unemployment rate can be at an all-time low. The next moment, 10 million people hit the streets and are unemployed. One moment, the economy can be soaring. The next moment, we can be teetering on the next great depression. One moment, we could be eating, drinking, and living large. The next moment, we can be standing at death's doorstep. The cross tells us, it reminds us that things can change suddenly. This life is a vapor. It's here today. It's gone tomorrow. It's symbolized by a dash. The things that we put all of our hope and all of our trust in really matter little in light of eternity. What matters most is what stands between this life and the next. What matters most is the cross that bridges the great divide. The cross that makes it possible to get to the other side. The cross that represents the mercy of the Father that cost him his only son. The cross speaks to us. Things can change suddenly. The second message of the cross is what we've been talking a lot about. All weekends that we've experienced online service, all of our Bible studies, 
God has led me to remind you, Jesus loves you. The cross tells us Jesus loves us. Why else would he go to the cross? Why, what did he personally have to gain? Why else would the God of heaven and the creator of the universe condescend to such punishment? Why else would he leave the tranquility of heaven for the testing and torture of the crucifixion? Why else would the creator subject himself to the scourging of those he created? Why else would he who holds the worlds in his hand allow his hands to be nailed to a tree? Why else would the one whose words cause the world to come into existence hold his tongue and not call on legions of angels to come and rescue him? Why didn't he fight back? Why why did he remain silent? Why was he like a sheep led to the slaughter? Why? What else could it be but love? And not just any love. A love that is undeserved. A love that is unearned. A love that often goes unrequited. A love that is not based on the actions of the recipient, but wholly based on the virtue of the giver. 1 John chapter 4, verse number 10 says, In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his only son to be a propitiation for our sins. The reason why he did it is love. Romans chapter 5 verse number 8 speaks about this love. It says, but God demonstrated his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Billy Graham nailed the why when he spoke of the cross. Listen to what Billy Graham said about the cross. There he hung, suspended between heaven and earth, having suffered unspeakably. The spikes never held him there. It was the cords of love that bound him tighter than any nails that man could mold. But God commanded his great love toward us even while we were still sinners because Christ suffered for us. But the physical suffering of Jesus Christ was not the real suffering. Many men before him had died, he said. Others had hung on the cross longer than he. Many men had become martyrs. The awful suffering of Jesus Christ was his spiritual death. He reached the final issue of sin, fathomed the deepest sorrow when he cried, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That cry was proof that Christ, having become sin for us, died physically and spiritually, and with it, having lost all sense of the Father's presence in that moment, he who knew no sin was made sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. On the cross, he was made to be sin. He was God forsaken because he knew no sin. Billy Graham says, there is value beyond comprehension in the penalty that he bore, a penalty that he did not need for himself. How it was accomplished in the depths of darkness, man will never know. Here's what he said. He said, but this one thing I know. He bore my sins in his body on that tree. He hung where I should have hung. The pain of hell that were my portion were heaped upon him and I'm able to go to heaven and merit that which is not my own but is his in every right. What was he saying? The cross tells me that God loves me in every single way. It shouts out to us. The cross is God putting a stake in the ground and letting us know, I love you with an unconditional love. But the third thing that the cross tells us, and it is so important for us to hear this right now, the cross tells us emphatically, he's not punishing us. I have heard it said that this virus is God's punishment on the world for sins, to which I point all my fellow brothers and sisters to the cross of Christ. If there was ever a time for him to punish mankind, it would have been at the crucifixion. Prior to the cross, he was betrayed by his own friends for money. Prior to the cross, he was arrested unjustly by Roman soldiers. He was innocently inter inter interrogated by the high priest. He was tried and found guilty with false evidence. 
He was denied by his closest friend, Peter. He was beaten by soldiers. He was questioned by Pontius Pilate. He was whipped with a Roman cat and nine tail. He was condemned to death. He was mocked by the Roman guard with a fake royal robe and a king's crown made of thorns. He was ordered to carry his own cross up to Golgotha until he couldn't. He was stripped. He was nailed and he was suspended between two deserving thieves. If there was ever a time for God to punish mankind it would have been then but instead of screaming screaming out vengeance his first words were puzzling they're in our text his first words that he cried from the cross verse number 34 father forgive them for they do not know what they do can i be honest that's not what i would have said you would have had a bleep out what i would have said if i experienced all that but that's what he said. And what he said is a message from the cross for this moment in time. And the message is clear and the message is a clarion call. It is letting us know God is not punishing us. This virus is man-made and God will rescue us and God will forgive us. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 9 says, For God, listen carefully, was in Christ reconciling the world to himself no longer no longer, no longer. That means God stopped doing this. That's what it means in the Greek, in, in, at least from my perspective. No longer counting people's sins against them. God is not holding the world's sins against him anymore. God put all the world's sins on Jesus. Can I illustrate this for you? Can I, can I show you what this really means? Recently, in my time off with my family, we watched a movie, maybe you saw it. It's called A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood. It's a uh, tribute to Mr. Rogers. Everybody remembers Mr. Rogers from back in the day. I was going to wear my little Mr. Rogers get up and gear. My wife told me not to, so I did. Anyway, one of the things that he does at the beginning of the movie is he, he pulls out this picture board, and he's got these doors that he opens up, and behind each door, he introduces us to some of his friends in the neighborhood, and uh, some of these you'll, you'll recognize. I want to show you the, the people in the neighborhood he showed us. He showed us Mr. McFeely. Are you having a warm fuzzy from your childhood, Mr. McFeely? You all remember him? Anyway, one of Mr. Rogers' friends. And then, of course, he, he pulled out another door, and he showed us another picture. And, and this was King Friday. Do y'all remember King Friday from back in the day? King Friday. And, of course, no Mr. Rogers episode or tribute can, can be a complete without Daniel the Tiger. Do y'all remember Daniel the Tiger? I mean, he was like the star of the movie. Anyway, and then he shows us another picture of the ugliest woman ever to dawn a television screen. And you say, Pastor, that's kind of cruel. Lady Elaine. Look at how ugly Lady Elaine is. I mean, she's a puppet, so we can call her ugly right there. But, I mean, you would think that this, this, this woman is kind of scary looking for kids. He showed us that picture. But then here's where it got serious. He pulled out another door and opened another door, and another picture emerged. And it was somebody we had never known from our childhood. And he held up this picture. And he said this. He said, this is my friend Lloyd, and he's having a hard time forgiving right now. And then he says this in typical Mr. Rogers fashion. He says, do you know what forgiveness means? And the story is all about how Lloyd, with Mr. Rogers' help, goes through a journey on forgiving his father because Lloyd's father walked out on him and his sister and his dying mother when he was just a teenager. And Lloyd had to become the man of the family. And Lloyd and his sister had to figure it out. And Lloyd and his sister, without the help of any adults, without the help of their father, had to put their dying mother to rest. And so Lloyd built up all of this resentment and anger and frustration and bitterness, rightfully so, toward his father. And his father walked back into his life and wanted to regain a relationship with him. And Lloyd wasn't having it. And so Mr. Rogers holds up this picture, and he says, this is my friend Lloyd. He's having a hard time with forgiveness now. Do you know what forgiveness is? And I thought about that. And I thought, if I was Mr. Rogers, there would have been one more picture that I would have showed on the picture board. Matter of fact, he doesn't do it, but he is the inspiration behind Mr. Rogers' life. And I want to show you this picture, and 
You might not recognize him, but you may. This is my friend Jesus. He's my Savior. He's not having a hard time forgiving right now. Despite all of what was done to him, despite the beating that he took, he's not having a hard time forgiving us right now. See, one of the things that you and I have to realize about Jesus is unlike Lloyd, he is able to forgive us. That's why he went to the cross when he should have punished us. He prayed for us. When he should have shouted out, Father, repay them. He shouted out, Father, forgive them. And here is the thing about my friend and Savior, Jesus. That prayer he prayed was not just for them. That prayer that he prayed was for all of us who would ever come after them. For them, he prayed it this way. Look at him from the cross after they did this to him. Not punishing them, but praying for their forgiveness. He prays, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You know how he would pray for us and how he is praying for us today? Father, forgive them, even though they often do know what they do. The wonderful thing about my friend Jesus and my Savior Jesus is that he's not having a hard time forgiving right now. Matter of fact, it's the very reason why he went to the cross. Matter of fact, the forgiveness that he offers doesn't come with an expiration date. We don't know that how, how powerful his forgiveness is. And to say that God is punishing us when God put our punishment on Jesus who willfully took it and did not exercise judgment or retaliation but cried out from the cross, Father, forgive them, is an insult to what Jesus did on the cross. There's an old song that says it best. There is a fountain filled with blood that flows from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. One more time. This is my friend Jesus. He's my Savior. He's not having a hard time forgiving right now. The fourth thing the message of the cross speaks to us in this crisis is we have a choice. You might have remembered from our text, verse number 33 says, and when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the criminals, one on the right hand and one on the left. Here we find two people that represent the only two choices that we can make when it comes to Jesus. The cross tells us we have a choice. One of the criminals rejected him, who he was and what he was offering. The other criminal accepted him, who he was and what he was offering. He asked, he asked for forgiveness. And on that cross, while Jesus was hanging and that man was dying, that man didn't receive punishment, but that man received forgiveness because he chose to put his faith in Jesus Christ. We can't earn forgiveness. Nothing that we can do can make us right with God in and of ourselves. And God knew that about us. He knew our human condition. He knew no matter how hard we tried, we would fail. And so God doesn't ask us to earn it. God asks us to choose it, to choose life. Right now, the government has put the choice of life in our hands. They have asked us all, not mandated us, but asked us to practice social distancing. They have said stay six feet apart from one another. They have said don't have large gatherings. They have said work from home. Why? They're asking us to choose life to help them get this thing under control so we can get to the other side of it. And we're all doing it because we're on the side of life. But God has also put the choice of life in our hands. He said this, he said, I lay before you this day, life and death. Choose life that you may live. And when it comes to Jesus, we have to choose to put our faith in who he is and what he offers. See, right now we have to distance from one another. But can I tell you what we really need to do while we're distancing from one another is we need to draw near to God. Draw near to God through Jesus Christ. And in a minute, I'm going to give you another point that's going to give you some hope. But right now, just in this moment, I just feel the Holy Spirit leading. 
Have you made Jesus the Lord of your life? Have you chosen to put your faith in who he is and what he offers? Are you forgiven for the sins that we all know that we've committed? If you haven't, I want you to pray this prayer with me right there. Heavenly Father, today I choose to repent of my sins and I ask you to forgive them all. The ones I knew I was committing, the ones I didn't know. As I put my faith in Jesus Christ, forgive me in Jesus' name and I'll never be the same. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, there's a little button if you're watching church online that says raise your hand, press it. One of our moderators will reach out to you. It's important for you to actually tell somebody you gave your life to Jesus. If you're watching on Facebook, you can type Jesus in in the chat. One of our moderators will reach out to you. We'll help you to grow in your relationship with the Lord. The cross tells us that we have a choice. But there's one other thing the cross tells us. And I love this about the cross. And it's a famous, famous point about the cross. The cross tells us, number five, Sunday is coming. Sunday is coming. Here's how I'd like to end this service today. It's Friday. Jesus is praying. Peter is sleeping. Judas is betraying. But Sunday is coming. It's Friday. Pilate's struggling. The council is conspiring. The crowd is vilifying. But they don't even know Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The disciples are running like sheep without a shepherd. Mary's crying. Peter is denying. But they don't even know Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The Roman soldiers beat my Jesus. They put a robe of scarlet on him. They crown him with thorns. But they don't even know Sunday is coming. It's Friday. See Jesus walking to Calvary. His blood is dripping. His body is stumbling. His spirit is burdened. But you see, it's only Friday. And Sunday is coming. It's Friday. The world's winning. People are sinning. Evil is grinning. It's Friday. The soldiers nail my Savior's hands to the cross. They nail my Savior's feet to the cross. And then they raise him up next to criminals. It's Friday. But let me tell you something. Sunday is coming. It's Friday. The disciples are questioning what has happened to their king. And the Pharisees are celebrating that their scheming has been achieved. But they don't know it's only Friday. Sunday is coming. It's Friday. He's hanging on the cross feeling forsaken by his fathers left alone and dying can nobody save him oh it's Friday but Sunday is coming it's Friday the earth trembles the sky grows dark my king yields his spirit it's Friday hope is lost death is won sin is conquered and Satan just a laughing it's Friday Jesus is buried a soldier stands guard a rock is rolled into its place. It's Friday. It's only Friday. But Sunday is coming. Can I speak a word to you right now as we go through this virus as a community, as a nation, and as a world? It's Friday, but only Sunday, but Sunday is coming. Better days are ahead. Sunday is coming. Victory will come our way. Sunday is coming. I want to encourage you that though death and sickness may be all around, Sunday is coming. I may encourage you that the market is down, but Sunday is coming. The hospitals are filled, but Sunday is coming. Life has been turned upside down, but Sunday is coming. Jesus Jesus is on your side. Sunday is coming. I don't know if I was here right now. I know this place would be going wild. Sunday is coming. I want to encourage you. Don't lose hope. Jesus is somebody who comes back after Fridays with Super Sundays. I can't wait to see you all soon. I can't wait to celebrate Good Friday and Easter. I can't wait to celebrate that Sunday with you. Right now, I just want to pray over you. I want to just thank you for your faithfulness. All of our church, I'm so proud of you as a church. I'm so proud to be your pastor. Last week, we had 51,000 people tune in online. Dozens of people get saved. The gospel is going out because Sunday is coming. 
Thanks so much for watching, but don't just stop there. Click the Watch Live button in the description below to join us for Faith Church Online every Sunday morning. And while you're there, you can set a reminder to come back Sundays at 9 and 11. If you'd also like to learn more about getting involved here at Faith Church, you can click the Connect button. And be sure to subscribe to this channel so that you don't miss a single video and maybe even share it with a friend. Thank you again for watching. And as always, remember, with Jesus, you are destined to win.